to each of you. On a cloudy, rainy day, it's good to see you come in and the smiles on your face, though I can't see all of them, I just go by the sparkle in your eye. Uh, you're bringing the sunshine into our worship this morning. Good to have you with us. And happy Father's Day to the men of the church and the fathers of the community and to all of you who are listening we hope that this is a wonderful Father's Day for you all. A call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 103. Come, bless the Lord with me. For the Lord is like a father to his children. Compassionate and merciful. Filled with endless love, he forgives our sins. And heals the sickness inside us. He surrounds us with love and mercy. And fills our life with good things. Let us worship God together. Sam Rowe, my uncle, pulled me today. It's a pleasure. You're always welcome. 
Uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the session. Uh, Brother Ben and Mary are uh, Brim and Mary are in uh, at a promised family retreat. So uh, they were committed. They will be back next Sunday. Uh, offering plates is in the back of the sanctuary. And for you all that's watching on Facebook, uh, we are uh, the mailing address is there to mail the tithes in. Uh, also, if you have any subject or topics that you would like to explore in Scripture, uh, please send those to uh, Brother Bishop at poppyvet at gmail.com. And I was asked to make an announcement that uh, that we we need to increase our awareness to the increase of COVID-19 in this district. It is the county is up, so we're just asking everyone to really be safe and careful and, uh, you know, abide with face masks, the washing of hands, the distancing. Let's just practice good measures there. Um, just need everybody's cooperation. Are there any other announcements? If not, uh, Brother Romance, uh, he's going to lead us in the prayers of the people. Do you want to share some of these prayer requests we have? I can do that if you like. Y yes. Okay. Uh, we have a rather long list of prayer concerns, which is uh, which means people are hurting and people are in need of prayer. But it's a good thing for us to share those needs with each other. We're going to go through these quickly, and if you need to add some to it in a moment, you may. But first of all, let's do, uh, anyone have a birthday or anniversary today or this week? Any other announcements of joy? Did it feel good to finally get out? That's an announcement of joy. Let us share some of the prayer concerns that we have. Uh, Daryl Miller, the family of Sue Price, the family of Della Ann Smith, uh, Faye McIntyre, her husband Tommy, and son Tommy McIntyre Jr., Paul Stearman, uh, Jeff Wright has severe back pain, Sidney Smith, Steve Meyer, Elizabeth and Neil Melby have unspoken requests. Geraldine Melby, Beverly Knight, David Matthews, Whitney Scott, and six-year-old Briley Williams, Doyle Bush, Sarah Brightley, uh, Linda Ferguson, Carol Harmon, Carol Marr, Danny Bills, uh, Peggy Sproul, Laura Conley, uh, Rhonda and Wayne Wright, Larry and Sander Morgan, Ann Aiken, Doug Sidebottoms, uh, Ricky Edwards family, Martha Rubens, <coughs> Susan Montgomery, family of uh, Deanna Whitaker, uh, Tammy Sedlin Beck, Elijah Markham, Mary Virginia Stiles, Jolene Turner, Sue Rim, and Don Rector, and all who are in assisted living missing family uh, and they being with them. Taylor Coates and family, Rex Paxton, Danny Judd, Brooke Shaw, Elizabeth Jones, Reba Neal Tucker, Brian and Bruce Bilby, John Douglas Bilby, Joe Tommy and Barbara, Caitlin Wallace, and of course the people who are suffering from the virus, the health care workers who are trying to take care of them, the men and women in our armed forces and their families, and our friends in the Department of Veterans Hospital, uh, our country, of course, and our president, and I encourage you this Tuesday to go vote if you haven't voted already. Uh, our church and our fellow churches in the county and, and all across the nation and the world. Our members who are supporting us during this stressful time, our businesses that continue to recover. Uh, we pray for the people in Seattle who are living under anarchy. Uh, we pray for our nation and a peaceful end to the hate. 
We pray for true justice. We pray for the police officers, first responders, and National Guard. And may we bring people to Christ where love and Christ's kingdom and the peace of Christ survive. We pray for our nation and that will return and seek forgiveness to Jesus. Can love heal our division and our land? We hope that it can. So join me in prayer. God, we come to you at this moment with so many people on our hearts and on our minds. And many of the people that we've talked about and many of the general categories are, are countless numbers of people. But God, you tell us that you know the very hairs on our head, the number of them. So you know us all. You know the need that's in our hearts, in our lives, in our spirit. You know how we hurt we know how we share grief. You know all there is to know about. You know more about us than we know ourselves. So as we lift these folks up to you in prayer today, we are most certain that you hear our prayers because you know us. And our prayer, God, is that first of all, you simply give us what we need today. We'll let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. And we'll come back to you tomorrow in time of prayer again but meet our need this day. We ask that you would be with our nation, especially in this time of turmoil. We ask that you would be with our churches who are, who are struggling to find a way to share in worship together, but are also discovering, God, that through the social media we are able to touch and reach many more people's lives than we ever imagined. God, you are blessing the church in that way. We ask that you would continue to bless the church. We ask that you would be with the pastor of this church as, as there are a family retreat uh, together. Uh, may they be made stronger in you. We pray for this congregation, God, that as they uh, serve you in this community, that their spirit would come from you and it would be a spirit of love and caring and kindness. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to share these moments together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we join together as we pray that prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Call Brother Romine Friday and let's see what party we're going to do on the service today. And he requested this song. I think it goes right along with your sermon. Uh, on my father's side. And of course, I had never heard the song before. And I, I well, anyway, I Googled it and, and got some versions of it. So I picked the one that I want to try to do. It is a song that really needs two parts to it, but. I'm going to try to do both parts. We'll see how it goes here. <clears throat> it is. The name of it is the same as, uh, as this sermon on my father's side. Just a young boy in a temple one day. Shared with the doctors, they were amazed. Never had they seen one so young speak so swift. They asked them many questions, and the conversation went like this. What's your name, son? On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, 
They call me Emmanuel. How old are you? On my mother's side. Now I'm 12 years. But on my father's side, I've just always been. Where are you from? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. Well, what's your plan, son? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, in three days I'll rise and sit by my father's side. Yet the son of man, I can't help but wonder how Joseph felt. Through an open door one day, he heard his son reply, I'm the king of kings that's on my father's side. On my mother's side, I'm Jesus, but on my father's side, They call me Emmanuel. On my father's side, I am 12 years. But on my father's side, I just always been. On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. On my father's side, it's Jerusalem. On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, three days I'll arise and sit on my father's side. May I say, Gerald, I thought you did an excellent job with that. Thank I appreciate you. it very much. That is the title of my sermon on my father's side. would like to share a few passages of scripture with you this morning. First of all, from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. This is when Moses is recounting the story with the children of Israel and the commandments that God gave them. And in this one, he says, Honor your father and your mother. As the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long, and so that you may prosper in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Then in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus says, For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. Then Matthew 6, 9 We've already used this one this morning. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you, first of all, for the power of your scripture. We're thankful for the truth of your word. And we thank you that you have entrusted your church to share that power and that word with the world. So now, God, we simply ask that our words would be acceptable to you and the meditations of our heart and our mind would be pleasing. Thank you, God, for this awesome privilege of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it's quite clear from the passage of Scripture that Scriptures demand we honor our father and mother. I know we weren't able to meet during Mother's Day because of the COVID-19. I almost said today, and rather than having Father's Day message, it's going to be Parents' Day because we're all in this together. So there will be some remarks that can apply to, to fathers and to mothers and parents in general. 
So the scripture demands this. Honor your father and your mother. This is the only commandment that God gave that's got a promise. And the promise was very simple. That you may live long and you may prosper in the place where the Lord God is giving you. Imagine now. God chooses to bless his people. But he's making it clear to them that if you want your children to live long in the land and prosper, then basically he's saying on the other side of this is, fathers and mothers, you need to treat your children so that they will learn how to respect you. Now I know that we have many wonderful fathers and mothers. We also have many just average fathers and mothers. And we have fathers and mothers that just aren't worth shooting, to be frankly. But there are fathers, and there are mothers. And we understand that following this commandment of honoring your father and mother, it's important. It's a commandment with promise, and why that is true is because it can lead the next generation to follow God. You see, we're really only about two generations from forgetting God. Now let that soak in a moment. If one generation fails to teach another generation the things of God and the truth of the scriptures, by the time the third generation comes along, they will not know God. Judges chapter 2, verse 10 says, the whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. In other words, they died. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. It doesn't take long to forget God. So fathers and mothers, you see how important it is to pass your faith on to your children. One grandparents day, I asked the grandparents in my, in my church, uh, you know, see, children are okay, you have to deal with them, but you know, there's nothing greater than grandchildren, right? They're just wonderful. But I asked the grandparents, what would you do to ensure that your children or grandchildren had a faith, and had a future. What would you be willing to do? It's important. You see, when we follow the good advice of godly fathers and mothers, the truth of the matter is, our living is just better. It's better. You see, many problems in our society today that we're witnessing right now can be traced back to the absence of a father in children's lives. That cuts across all social borders. I don't have to say, and I don't know why, fathers are absent in some families. The fact is, they are. And we're having to deal with the, with the consequence of those fathers not being present. In the scripture, it's quite plain that the fathers are to be the head of the household in teaching their children the things of God. To be honest, we know that it follow, falls on fathers and mothers both, doesn't it? We both need that. So the question that we might ask, how might the Christian or the church respond to this social problem of children being without fathers in the home. Well, first of all, let me say, if you're present in worship today, or if you're with us by internet or Facebook, as a father, you are making a great statement to your children by sharing this time of worship. It's one of the things I remember about my father. He was an elder in the church. He was a part of worship. It was expected for us to be in church whenever the doors were open. He saw to that. He led in prayer during the meals. 
I've heard him pray it many other times. He struggled with being an elder in the church to make sure things in church went well. I grew up in a church that had some problems. Evidently, with everything I hear from this church, you have no problems. I don't quite believe that. <laughs> but there's always something coming up, and it can be a stress on the elders. I've seen my father literally become sick trying to deal with the stress of the problems in the church. It was on his heart so much. So that impressed me that the church was important. And you men in the church, you Christian men, it's time to step up and be a mentor to some child whose father is absent in their family. Elaine and I have a, uh, an alpaca 4-H club. It's only one in the state of Kentucky. And we can tell quite quickly those kids that come to us who, whose father are active in their life and whose father is not active in their life. The one that's not active in their life seems just to cling to me. They need someone. They need someone. So Christian men, step up and, and mentor a child. As Christians, we can lift children up in prayer and encourage them. So very, very important. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 shares this with us. Fathers, do not treat your children in such a way as to make them angry. Instead, raise them with Christian discipline and instruction. This is a tough one. How do you raise a child and not make that child angry? How do you discipline a child and not make that child angry? How do you instruct a child and not make them angry? That child has to see your love first. Has to see your love. But we must remember God's purpose in discipline and instruction. God's purpose, as well as us as parents, his purpose for discipline is to restore the child, to bring them back, to get them on the right path. Not to punish them, but to bring them back. And sometimes that involves punishment, and punishment can be in so many different ways. But we need to be, cons be constructive in their life by instructing them in their lives. So that's God's purpose, to restore, to break back, to fulfill life. Share with you just a few examples how my father disciplined me and instructed me. My father only spanked me one time in my life. And it broke my heart because I didn't think he would. And I did something stupid. Right there in front of him, I pushed my brother down. I deserved it. I got away with a lot of things that I didn't get spanking for, I have to admit that. But he spanked me, and he didn't hurt me physically, but it broke my heart. And I decided then, I'll never do anything where my father will catch me anyway. Yeah, you know, just a kid. Just a kid. But his favorite way of getting my attention, he'd reach in his pocket, get out his pocket knife, and hold it in his hand and just tap you on the head one time. I couldn't figure out for the longest time how his thump could be so hard until I finally saw the knife. It didn't take much to get my attention. It didn't hurt me bad. It just hurt. But he also taught me an instructing when there was a mechanical problem with some of the farm machinery, I, I wanted to, to get it fixed, so I'd drive it, take it to the shop and, and say, Dad, this is broke. And he said, well, son, you broke it. Why don't you fix it? I don't know how. He said, well, just sit out here with me a minute. Look at it. See if you can figure out how it works. If you can figure out how it works, you might be able to figure out how to fix it. So we both sat there and scratch our head. 
He'd let me try whatever I wanted to try. If it didn't work, he said, well, sit down again, look at it some more. That has been so valuable to me over my years. But what I did not know is that my father only had an eighth grade education. And he served in World War II, and after World War II was over, he went to the veterans school and came out with a high school degree or equivalent. And I saw him tackle so many things that he didn't know how to do it at first. But he read about it, he studied it, he observed it, and he was not afraid to try something that was new to him. That was most valuable to me. And then there's that $5 deal he made me when I was five years old. The best deal I ever made in my life. I didn't know what was being involved there. By the time I was five years old, I was going to the barn and I had one old cow to milk. And about that time, Dad said, we got some calves due and if there's a heifer calf coming along, you can pick one out and if you pay me five dollars for that heifer calf, whatever you make out of that is yours to keep. That $5 investment put me through college. And when it came time to go to seminary, I couldn't go home anymore and help work on the farm and put up the hay. You see, that was a deal Dad made with me. That while I was in college in the summer, I would come back and put up the hay for all the cows. Good deal. I had to sell my cows when I went to seminary. But in doing that, they finished paying for my seminary education, and I had money left over to go to the Holy Land, all for a $5 investment. Think of what my father taught me in that. Wonderful. What, what's the goal of fatherhood, anyway? Well, first of all, we would say to provide for our families. I think the first goal is really for a father to love his family like he loves himself. The next one is to be the man that points your child toward Jesus and to God. The third one is, as God is our guide to the perfect father. That's who we as fathers must look to to be a good father. You remember what Jesus responded to his mother when she found him at the temple <clears throat> at age 12. And she says, Don't you know that myself and your father have been looking for you all this time? What, what do you think you're doing? And Jesus' response is, Didn't you know I must be about my father's work? This is where the old song comes in, on my father's side. And I want to repeat the course again. Gerald sang it very, very clear, wonderful. He's sitting there in a the temple. He's amazing, the doctors and the teachers, and they're asking him questions. Imagine that. What's your name, son? On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side... They call me Emmanuel. How old are you, son? On my mother's side, I'm just now 12 years old. But on my father's side, I've just always been. Where are you from, son? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. What's your plan, son? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, in three days I'll arise and I'll sit at my father's side. He returns to the glory of God on his father's side. 
I hope someday that after I get to heaven, the first person I want to meet and see is Jesus. And the next one is, I want to go set my dad. I want to go set my dad. You see, the song points out Jesus' earthly life on his mother's side and his heavenly life on his father's side. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, each one of us are a combination of our mother and our father's DNA. That's who we are. Like it or not, that's who you are. But as Christians, we're also a combination of the physical world and the spiritual world's DNA. That's who we are. Physically, that's where our earthly DNA comes in. That's the things we have to deal with as being human beings. On the spiritual side, our heavenly DNA comes from our Father's side, our heavenly Father's side. So we too can say, on my mother's side, this and this and this, but on my Father's side, this and this and this. Jesus even taught us to pray as we did this morning, our Father which art in heaven. Well, what are some of the issues that we face today where we can declare on our Father's side, our spiritual DNA? When we find ourselves on our physical side, troubled by the world events, and we're wrestling with those things right now. And we say, but on my Father's side, I heard Jesus say, I have overcome the world. On the earthly side, I wrestle with unrest and high tensions. How many of you, when you had to stay at home during this virus, the tension level went higher in your home? It, it did in hours some. But it was some good things too. But on my father's side, I have peace in Jesus. Only the kind of peace that Jesus can give. We live in a world which declares on that DNA side disrespect for the law, for police, for first responders, for order, for a lot of things. But on my father's side, we have the author and designer of perfect order with us. That statement is loaded. Loaded. I cannot begin to imagine the creation of not just our world, not just our universe, but far, far beyond, more than we can begin to imagine. It all has been set in place so that it works together with each other. It is not haphazard. It follows certain laws that set up to start with. God is the God of order. He puts things in the right place. On my Father's side, I serve the author of order. On the earthly side, there's a lot of protesting simply for the fact I want to be noticed, people say. I want what I want, no matter what it costs somebody else. But on my Father's side, the Scripture tells us we have learned in whatever state we are in to be content with God. On the earthly side, I am prone to sin and selfishness. But on my Father's side, we are forgiven so that we can live freely in obedient service to God. On the earthly side, whatever the world throws at us can be troubling. But on my Father's side, we have God's eternal purpose and eternal presence with us as the Holy Spirit. And even on the earthly side, especially as we all get a little older, 
We realize that life finally leads to the day we die. It leads to death. But on my father's side, death opens the door to a resurrected life. Hope is on my father's side. You see, our God, God our Father, has made us the most wonderful offer of full life in Jesus Christ. And like a wise father, God allows us to choose to accept that offer or not. Which do you think would be the wise choice for us? God gives us all the evidence we need to prove that his offer is true and is right for us. Your pastor has been doing some uh, uh, some some studies daily on on the uh, commandments of Jesus, the forty nine commandments. He's doing a wonderful job. I'm enjoying that. So thankful for your pastor that he's doing that. And in those, and as we read scripture, we find more and more proof that what God is offering us is true. It's right for us. Because you see, in all of history, natural history, biblical history, God is fulfilling His plan in Jesus Christ for our salvation. <coughs> I learned a German word while in seminary that uh, was quite interesting. I, it's amazing I still remember. The word is Uberlinkbringsgeschichte. What in the world does that mean? It means over the period of time of history, we learn. From the day God said, let there be light. It's interesting, that's what he said first, didn't it? He was planning to send the light of the world, his son. He knew us. He knew the choices we would make. So all through history, it's pointing to what God is doing. So may we each today honor our Father and accept God's offer of eternal life. And we can all say, on my Father's side, I have life eternal to the glory of my Heavenly Father. Amen. If you have a need this morning, here personally, we invite you to respond to God's calling on your life, your Heavenly Father. If you're listening to us on Facebook, uh, you, can, you can contact the Greensburg Cumberland Presbyterian Church, or you can contact me, Sam Robines, and any of us would be glad to talk to you about the life you can have on your Father's side your Heavenly Father. So respond to God, which so is so important today for us to have and to know. So our hymn of invitation and commitment we share today. Please join us in the faith of our fathers to sing the first and the third.
which expressed itself through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to us and fulfills itself in God's eternal promise of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and always. And the people said, Amen. Amen.